So what do you have to show us? Uh, well, gosh, where do we start here? Um, yeah, I mean, we've seen all the we, we've we've watched all the stuff that you've said on uh, other podcasts and Joe yeah, Rogan in preparation fans. for yeah, yeah we're, big fans. We big love fans. this stuff. I mean, I I was a big fan uh, long before we started doing the review for doing this show, but uh, we again went back through all that stuff and and I mean, we're on board and you know we loved uh, Graham Hancock's books, which uh, borrowed a lot from you know the science that you had pointed out um, to tell the whole story of you know, the existing evidence that speaks of flood and the, you know, potential impact of a of large celestial bodies creating the melting heat necessary to create those super floods, et cetera. What's the latest stuff that you've been working on that you've you've accumulated? Uh I would say the latest stuff, you know, I, I mentioned earlier the drumlins. Um I've been trying to map uh the melting process because I believe that by by mapping the melting and finding these epicenters, we can actually pinpoint where there were impacts into the ice sheet. And what I've come to believe now is that there may have been at least six or seven impacts directly into the ice sheet, uh, which caused major melting. And, and this is just in the last, like for the last ice age, not for the previous right, five or six. Was, right. I, I think it was, we're looking at a clustered bombardment. Okay. I don't know if you guys remember, uh, 1994, July of 1994, Shoemaker-Levy 9. Uh, you had, let's see, it would have been March of 1993, was discovered a comet that was coming around Jupiter. It passed very close to Jupiter, so it, it was within its what's called the Roche limit, which is basically where Jupiter's gravity field overcomes the internal cohesion of the, of the cometary mass and rips it apart. Right. So. Uh, David Levy was the first discover of it, and and um, and then uh, Gene Shoemaker and Carolyn Shoemaker's wife followed up on it and did the, the original research, and then um, Brian Marsden, uh, uh, an astro astronomer, did the calculations after watching the thing for three months, watching the 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 single nucleus uh, uh, break apart into twenty one separate pieces, and then Brian Marsden did the calculations and realized that. About a year later, these um, when when this train of objects swung around the sun and passed the orbit of Jupiter again, that where it was going to cross the Jovian orbit, Jupiter was going to be right there. So right. they knew that it was going to be an impact. And since then, um, you know, one of the kind of to me exciting things is that you know a lot of comets now have been studied and observed to actually undergo this hierarchy of disintegrations where they basically fragment into to separate pieces. One larger one becomes fragmented and becomes multiple smaller pieces. Those smaller pieces can then go through uh, further uh, fragmentation events. Um, and eventually what happens is a comet, if it, if it doesn't get uh, hit a planet or get swept into the sun, which is typic, a very typical um, life ending event for, for a comet, it will actually just eventually disintegrate into cosmic dust. Right. But in the case of Shoemaker Levy 9, we saw 21 impacts into Jupiter within uh, less than a week. And, you know, now there are these catena that are crater chains that are being discovered on all of the solid body planets in the solar system. And we've seen multiple breakups of comets. And so uh, there is now a school of thought that that multiple impact events are far more common than anybody had actually imagined. And a lot of the critics of, of the impact hypothesis, they're basically, their straw man is that, well, the, is this model that, well, if you're talking about an impact, you're just looking at one singular event that would have one effect, and then that effect is over. But we've actually seen that the, the melting took, you know, three or 4,000 years. The megafaunal extinctions didn't happen all at once, which is true, which is right. true. Um, so therefore, it wasn't, it wasn't an impact event. But I think what we're looking at is, a, I would call it an impact epoch, where you have a period of time, and I didn't originate this idea. This idea, I think the earliest uh, that I came across this idea was a group of, of British astronomers, the so-called neocatastrophe school. Victor Klub um, uh, was, was the leader of this group, and they basically, and, and studied, comets and the life cycle of comets for, for decades and concluded that multiple impact events were far more common than any, anybody had, had 
uh, realized before. What we've learned in the interim, is, you know, verifies that, that yeah, multiple impact events seem to be, again, far more common. And I think that we can explain the events of the end of the last ice age by invoking an idea of multiple impacts. And, and maybe sometimes, you know, the, the, we had, there was a tremendous melting event that was dated at 14,600 years ago. No explanation right. for what that was. There was then the 12,900 year onset of the Younger Dryas. And that is where the black mat layer is found, where the impact proxies have shown up. Um, the, the nano diamonds, the microspherals, the, the platinum layer, the iridium layer, and so on. All the they, solid connections <laughs> where they actually like, like hit. Yeah, yeah. Randall, I got, I got a question before we shift topics because I, I, I was going over some um, – uh, Robert Schock? Robert Schock? John Schock? Robert, Robert Schock. Robert Schock stuff and um, uh, something he had mentioned, and I don't know how much of a proponent he is of this, but I didn't realize this either, that a large enough coronal mass ejection would create or induce rather um, catastrophic lightning strikes all over the earth. I think this is plausible too. But I guess one could, like a comet could do the same thing too, right? Yes. Uh, and, and really what I think we might be looking at here is a perfect storm of, of events because, uh, in, and here's another, in, in terms of, of recent research and, and things that I've been looking into is sun grazing comets. And there seems to be now a link ever since we've had these, uh, solar observing satellites up in the last 20 years. We've just dis discovered and learned a whole lot about the sun we didn't know before. One of the things that has come out of this is the, the, the extraordinary numbers of sun grazing comets. We have not been able to see because when you look at the sun, obviously the, 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 it's so bright, it, it obscures anything like a cometary nucleus. But there have now been hundreds of of, of the sun grazing comets. And like, this seems to be one of the most common uh, lifespan terminations for a comet is to fall into the sun. Well, here's what's interesting to me. And this is just like, I'm very in the early stages of researching this, but I think this could be the thing that sort of um, brings together what Graham Hancock, for example, has been promoting, which is impact and what Robert Schock has been promoting, which is, which is a, a solar storm or a CME or coronal mass ejection. And the two, those, those two have kind of been going at it for a few years over who's right. I come into the picture and I'm saying, well, I think we're all right. I think because what we're seeing now is that there is a disproportionate response to the sun when these comets fall into the chromosphere. What we're seeing is a comet plunges into the chromosphere, you know, literally moving thousands of kilometers per second because it's accelerating as, the, as it's being sucked in by the sun's enormous gravity field. Plunges into the chromosphere, and then what do we see? We see a solar storm emanating from that spot. We see a huge geomagnetic anomaly. We see solar flares emanating out. And these are small cometary nuclei. If we're looking at a situation like we might have been looking at 12,000, 13, 14,000 years ago, which consistent with the British neocatastrophists, the idea was that you had a huge comet mass, cometary nucleus comes into the inner solar system, starts like a ping pong game between Jupiter and the sun, begins to fragment and begins to litter the inner solar system with the debris of its, of its uh, fragmentation. And the earth on multiple occasions might encounter that debris. Sometimes to a lesser extent, sometimes to a greater extent. At the same time, a lot of this debris is falling into the sun. The evidence seems to now suggest that the sun might react to that. And so it could very well be that we're yeah, looking I mean, at, you know, like I said, a perfect storm of stuff. <clears throat> and the sun may have played a very dominant or important role, I'll say an important role in these events. Because to my knowledge, the 14,600 year melting I have not found any evidence of any impact proxies at that, at that date. So, but something triggered a massive melting. They call it meltwater pulse 1B. And you had this huge influx of meltwater into the global oceans. And that was the initial rising of sea level. And then, you know, uh, basically 1300 years later, you had the younger Dryas and, um, you know, that's where the impact proxies are showing up. And then 1300 years after that, you have, um, what is called the, the Younger Dryas pre-boreal boundary, which is the 11,600 date, which 
which is the Plato's date. And I, there may be some initial evidence suggesting an impact at that point, but it's this, this stuff is so early, um, you know, in its stages, nobody has really looked at these, at these boundaries. And, and if you don't look for something, obviously you're not going to mm-hmm. find it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Funny thing about that. <laughs> well, you know, the multiple uh, simultaneous impact points, any kid who's tried to throw a mud ball has probably experienced that where you put enough energy into a body that doesn't have a lot of cohesion and it's going to break apart and you're going to wind up slinging most of your mud uh, in multiple directions. Like when monkeys throw shit. <laughs> like when monkeys throw shit, exactly. So, which uh, I guess Doug has found out the hard way. <laughs> I did have a pet monkey, By so I, I know this. Shit at each other. I have done firsthand scientific <laughs> observations of how they do this. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so what... Now, yeah, I mean, drumming? I know that well. One of the things, you know, back in the in the early 60s, we didn't have, you know, boys didn't have a lot of things. We had to kind of invent our own amusement. So one of the things was that near where I lived, uh, gangs of boys would kind of gather on each side. We would have dirt clod wars. Yeah, classic. Oh, yeah. Mud ball wars. That are acorn <laughs> fights. Mud ball fights. <laughs> no, dirt clod wars are, are much better because <laughs> they, they hurt when they hit. <laughs> But yeah, so I remember well fragmenting dirt clods. Yeah, you're always looking for that solid dirt clod to get that, or sticking a rock in the center. Yeah, of yeah it. a rock. Yeah, or, or the cheaters here in the group. Yeah. We do this. <laughs> coat, coat of rock and some and some like thin layer of dirt, or some yellow snow, <laughs> or just throw a rock. 